Welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, new seminar of uh, the Reproducibility Basel and uh, the uh, Open Science course of the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Today, we are joined by Serena Bonaretti, who is a senior researcher at Bagris Campus in Zurich, in Switzerland. And her main interests are musculoskeletal image acquisition and analysis combined with biomechanics with application to bone and joint diseases. In the last years, she has dedicated time and efforts to do and promote open and reproducible research through talks, a YouTube channels, and if you're seeing this on YouTube, the link will be in the description, and community service. And she's part, she founded and she's part of the Ormir community, uh, of which uh, some of us are also part, uh, and uh, it has a website. And if you're interested in a musculoskeletal uh, uh, research, uh, please visit us again. We'll put a link in the description. I personally know Serena. I've been known, I've known her for a while. Uh, she's a wonderful person. Uh, she's very knowledgeable, uh, and uh, she has worked as a, a Python tutor uh, in the last few years. And she even has a book, uh, which uh, she will uh, briefly talk about. Uh, and of course, if you want to uh, see the book, uh, uh, we will also uh, show you the link uh, so you can. Uh, uh, enjoy uh, what she has written. So thank you very much, Serena, for being here with us. We are very much looking forward to your presentation. And uh, please, you can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, from Francesco. And thanks, uh, everybody, uh, for uh, not only for the invitation, but also for being here uh, today, for uh, uh, spending your time with me. And I hope it will be worth it. Uh, so let me share the screen. Um, Let's see, share, all right, it should be there. And now I'm going to do the presentation and I will put you down, forgive me. Um, okay, we should be fine. If there are any issues, just stop me. So um, you can uh, look for me also on Twitter if you want, uh, and you can find uh, this presentation on Zenodo at uh, tinyurl.com slash Basel T. You're going to be forwarded to the Zenodo repository so that you can download the presentation and click the various links that uh, there are around in case you want to, um, to work parallel together with me and start browsing some of the material that I'm proposing. Um, so I would like to start by sharing how I started coding in an open and reproducible way. And it was an actual practical problem. Um, I had uh, to segment and analyze some knee images. In musculoskeletal imaging, we acquire images. And uh, um, this was a specifically a collaboration with uh, some scientists who didn't have uh, a lot of background in, uh, in, in coding. And uh, they wanted to basically segment or select what you see here in red, that is the um, femoral cartilage to measure osteoarthritis progression. And so the first thing that we have to do, as I mentioned, was to segment um, these, uh, these images and extract the cartilage. So as we, as scientists always do, I looked into the literature and this was back in 2016, 17, 18. I saw that there were uh, 29 algorithms already there uh, with uh, way less uh, deep, learning, uh, deep learning as there is now. And uh, only two implementations of these ones were open source. And these two were actually very not uh, very um, not very well curated. They were uh, the documentation was not good. The code was a bit messy, so for me it was very hard to use them. So what uh, I didn't know what to do uh, at that point, and I was not interested in creating another algorithm uh, because there were already twenty nine around. I just wanted to get it done, um, and I needed to create a workflow to segment and analyze uh, these images, and I wanted to focus on using algorithms that were already there, as I mentioned, but also I wanted to make it easy for the users. 
And so I didn't know where to start, but you know, as we usually do, I just started and initially uses, I used MATLAB. I wanted to use MATLAB, but uh, because that is what I was using, that was, a, that was what I knew and I already had some code uh, around. But MATLAB is not open source and not everybody, as, as silly as it sounds, um, has a MATLAB license. And I did not want also to write another closed source code algorithm that uh, would be would make me the 28th uh, publication with the closed uh, so, uh, closed code so I started in C++ uh, because I could use uh, the open source libraries ITK and Elastics uh, which are typical in image analysis but again um, I got into some issues because I had to create executables for Windows and uh, instead I work in, uh, in Mac OS and the command lines are not really ideal for people uh, who have a limited uh, coding experience. Plus, I'm not really very good, honestly, at coding in C++. And uh, the pipeline would have still be uh, fragmented because on one side, I would have had the code. And then if I wanted to create an interface, I should have used, um, I should have created a GUI. So I was still looking while I was coding and putting together pieces. I was still looking for a better solution. And then a statistician uh, showed me uh, that at that point, this was early 2016, around that time, um, there were these R markdown files that were kind of new. And uh, he told me, look, there is uh, something similar for Python, uh, which is getting some, that it, which is getting more and more popular. And it's called the Jupyter Notebook. So I started, I got very enthusiastic about it. I started looking into it and uh, I created the, what now is Pioneer, that uh, is an image analysis workflow for open and reproducible research on femoral knee cartilage. Uh, composed of uh, three parts, uh, pre-processing of the images, the segmentation of the images, and analysis. And uh, each of these uh, parts has uh, one or uh, more Jupyter notebooks associated to it um, that are used as user interfaces. So from uh, the each page, let's say each notebook goes directly from data upload to visualization of the results. And of course, behind the notebook, there is the actual Pioneer package. It is a Python package that is divided in modules and contains the core functions that are called in the notebook. And the, the idea is that users can load their images and run the notebook. So let's have a look um, uh, at, at Pioneer very quickly. Um, this is, of course, um, a demo. Uh, so I am not going to run calculations because they take a little bit of time. But just to give you an idea, um, first thing we import um, the, um, the package and its components. And then uh, uh, there is a pre processing part. Uh, and of course, this is a demo. So I'm shortening up. Um, uh, there is the first uh, part that I present here is the segmentation. So the idea is that we upload the file containing the, the file names of the images. We read uh, the images and then at a certain point in between we execute the segmentations and then we visualize the segmentations. And uh, as I mentioned before, you see that we go directly from, uh, in, from uh, importing the images uh, to the final results. And similar, if we want to calculate the morphology, so um, characteristics of shapes, uh, which uh, in cartilage it's mainly thickness. And so again, one uh, puts the parameter and uploads the files um, and uh, reads the data. And then basically there is uh, some code that I'm skipping because of uh, time, computational time. And you see again, this is the cartilage divided into components in two surfaces where we are gonna calculate the distance in between, and then I keep, I'm just doing shift control to run the various cells. And uh, eventually, um, after a bit of calculations, uh, uh, I got the visualizations of the results, um, but also a graph with the average thickness for each bone. In this case, there are only two samples, but this graph can be way more crowded. And similarly, the results are in a table that can be exported <clears throat> 
for further analysis. So similarly for the volume, and once more, you can see that from just the input files, we go all the way to the final results. And then I like to finish the notebook with dependencies, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about in a bit. Um, and it's basically the character, they represent the printout to the characteristics of my machine and of the, and, uh, of the package. So this was, uh, um, my story a little bit, but uh, how can we all do it? Um, how does the Jupyter Python environment works work? And here it's where I would like to share what I learned um, during uh, these years. So my idea of uh, the Jupyter uh, Python environment is the following: I imagine it as a Russian doll. Uh, you know, the nested, the wooden dolls nested in side um, one into the other. And there is uh, at the outside, the biggest doll is a Jupyter Lab, um, which is a web-based environment. Inside the Jupyter Lab, we can open Jupyter Notebook. Inside the Jupyter Notebook, we can code in Python and the Python can be enriched by several packages that we can use uh, to, again, enrich our code. Uh, so let's go through them step by step, but before doing that, how do we practically install all this uh, on our computers? There is uh, something called Anaconda, that is uh, a distribution of uh, um, Python and the Jupyter environment. If you go to this website, anaconda.com slash product slash distribution, you download an executable and you click next, 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 and then eventually when you run what is called the a quantum navigator, you're going to get to this page. And you see here different software, different tools that are embedded in Anaconda. And uh, you see that there is Jupyter Lab, there is also Jupyter Notebook as a standalone, but I prefer to use a Jupyter Lab and I will tell you uh, why. Um, this is Jupyter Lab. When we click on the launch in the previous window, this is what we get. Jupyter Lab, as you see, starts in the browser, um, but doesn't need the internet to work exactly like Jupyter Notebook. In fact, if you look uh, here in the URL, there is written local host. So you can use all the tools locally on your machine. Then of course, uh, there are a bunch of uh, the usual, I would say toolbars and uh, folder browsers. And uh, here in this part in the launcher, there are a lot of different tools that we can use. And so the notebook, but there is also terminal, we can uh, uh, open text files and so on. And uh, if we open, let's say a notebook, a terminal and the markdown file or a text file, we can have them, let's say one behind the other with, uh, overlapping tabs. But what is cool about the Jupyter Lab, and this is the reason why I like it so much, is that just by dragging and dropping the different tabs around, we can divide the working space with the different tools um, that, we, that we need. For example, I like to put the terminal on the bottom and then on the side, for example, a text file. And this allows us to organize the workspace the way we um, it's convenient for us and also to have everything in one place. Now let's focus on the Jupyter Notebook, the second doll of our uh, Russian doll. Um, Jupyter Notebook was released in 2014 by Fernando Perez, who is now a um, professor of statistics at uh, Berkeley uh, University. And uh, as an evolution of IPython, whom uh, Fernando created himself as well. And uh, what is nice uh, about uh, Jupyter, the definition is that it's a web-based application supporting various programming languages. And uh, what is nice is that uh, this uh, idea of supporting various programming languages, it's actually it's in, in its name because you see that uh, it can support the Julia, Python Notebook, and R, for example, beyond many other programming languages. And uh, the coolest thing that really is what uh, made me get very enthusiastic about um, Jupyter Notebook uh, is that we can integrate narrative and code. For the first time, we didn't have to have the code all on one side and the report on the other side, but we could merge the two things. So let's see what we can actually 
uh, how it looks like a bit more in detail from a technical perspective. A Jupyter notebook is basically just a sequence of cells. These gray rectangles that you see here, they're called the cells. And inside of these cells, we can actually write either narrative or code. Let's start with the narrative. The language that we use for the narrative is called the markdown, and it is a simplified version of the easy syntax. And uh, you can find plenty of resources online. This is a nice resource that I like, uh, markdownguide.org, that is really nicely structured and uh, helps you, uh, if you're new to this, helps you at understanding very quickly how to use them. Um, how to use Markdown. The text uh, can be, as you see, titles, can be actual plain text, can be lists. It has everything that we need to organize our narrative. Then we can also write equations, which of course in computational research is, they are extremely important and they are written in LaTeX. You just have to put these double dollar signs at the beginning and at the end and whatever LaTeX you put inside gets rendered integrated in the text in Jupyter Notebook. And last but not least, we can also add images. So to add an image, it is an exclamation mark, open and close the square brackets, and open and close round brackets with the file name of the image. And here, maybe it's not the most representative image, but you can conceive, consider also adding the image, I don't know, of a scanner that you're using or some instrumentation that you're using, and this is going to be part of the report. And then, of course, uh, the code. Um, the code, uh, I use a Python um, because it's uh, the most commonly used in my community in among the open source languages. And the Python was created by Guido van Rossum in 1991 in Amsterdam. And so a few characteristics about uh, this language. It has, let's say, the usual data types. So there are strings, there are lists. In other languages, they're called arrays or vectors, there are tuples that are immutable lists, there are booleans, there are dictionaries, which are called ethnic structures in other languages. There are conditions and loops, like again, in every other language. And so for the conditional statements, we have if, elif, and else. And for the for loop, what is interesting is this specific Python for loop that is used to browse elements in a list and usually goes to something like for number in numbers. So for singular in plural, and you can just go through the elements of a list and do whatever you need to do with them. And then of course, there is the usual while loop. And the functions, again, uh, nothing too new here. There are There is def as a keyword to define the function, function name, the body of the function. And then if we want to provide an input, we put the input in between round brackets. If we wanted to return an output, we write the keyword returned, return followed by the output. And again, to call the function, it's just the output is assigned function name input. What is uh, cool about Python, I think, uh, it's that the syntax is particularly easy. Uh, if you see here, there are no curly brackets, uh, no um, uh, um, overwhelming, there is no overwhelming syntax. What uh, actually helps us is the indentation to structure the code. And uh, the fact that it's so simple makes the code extremely readable for human beings because, uh, and I will say this a bunch of time, when we code, uh, that's true that we do it for the machine, but who is actually gonna read our code are other human beings. So it's important to make it as readable as possible. And then, as I mentioned before, Python is enriched by uh, a lot of packages. If you look on pypy.org, there are more than 400,000 projects right now. This is a screenshot I took this morning. And uh, just to give you an idea, PyPy is the one of pip install. If you're familiar with it, um, PyPy is a repository where we upload our packages so that people can do pip install. Pioneer or whatever else, and it gets installed in their machine. But how do we choose packages among these 400,000? Which ones are the ones we can actually rely on? For basic um, science, for basic um, tools, what uh, we can, uh, uh, a way of being sure, let's say, is to use uh, 
um, projects or packages that are funded by and supported by Nanfocus, which is a physical sponsor of uh, some of this part of the Jupiter community. And uh, you see, for example, that the uh, most uh, famous packages, basic as well, NumPy, Matplotlib, Pandas, um, they are part, they are supported by NumFocus. If you do medical imaging, also ITK uh, here is part, uh, is supported by NumFocus. And then, okay, there are packages specific for the different fields and for to know which one to use, I would recommend looking into what your colleagues do so that you can, it's always a good starting point. Let's put it like that. So what else is in the Jupyter Python environment? It's not only about uh, um, the Jupyter lab or the Russian doll part. Uh, there is much more. And for sure, there is a binder. Um, binder, uh, you can go to it to mybinder.org. And uh, Binder is an online tool to execute uh, Jupyter notebooks. So basically, you connect it to a GitHub repository. And uh, the Git on the GitHub repository, you put uh, this badge, uh, launch binder. You are going to go into a notebook, which is in an interactive environment where we that you can use to play with the notebook. And usually, this is convenient, for example, uh, for publications. I, I, I use it to, um, so that people can try out the code that I use, for example, to create a graph, or if you are in small workshops or in small classes, or to share in general um, notebooks with other people with an interactive, with a, sorry, an executive, executable, executing environment in the back. And uh, if you want to know how to do it practically, exactly what to put in, in these different fields, I have a video about that. I'm gonna put here, I put here a bunch of videos um, that you can look at if you want, they are mine. Let's say that uh, um, technically and uh, um, aesthetically, they are not the best videos ever, but the content is there. So I hope that they are useful. And some of them actually have quite a bit of views. Um, what else do we have? We have Jupyter Book, and Jupyter Book is another super cool thing. So basically, it's a way to bind together a bunch of notebooks, and then you run one command line, um, that, and it creates basically a website, let's say, or a book, an online um, documentation. And uh, this online documentation is really, um, I use it for websites, for example, and for each page, uh, even if it's a static, you can actually in the top, there are links to either download the notebook so you can play locally. Uh, there is uh, the link to GitHub and usually there is also the link to Binder. So even if the page is static, you can actually um, just with a click go into the interactive aspect. And then last but not least, there is a Jupyter Hub. Jupyter Hub is another super cool thing. It is a, um, a, a tool to host a distribution of a, a Jupyter environment. Basically, it's a server um, and it's used mainly in classrooms. It's a server uh, that has a Python environment and with a Jupyter built with all the, the packages that you need. And everybody can just log into this environment and they use the same computational notebook and try out again in a classroom or um, run code using material notebooks and code that is already available. Think about big research groups, for example. And then very last but not least, what is really cool and what is really in the Jupyter Python environment is that there are wonderful inspirational people. And, and it's true. Um, for example, um, Fernando Perez is the creator of, uh, of, um, of all this, um, Jupiter, uh, of the Jupyter world. Chris Holdgraf, who is taking care mainly of Binder, did Binder in the past, um, Jupyter Hub, Jupyter Book. Lorena Barba, who is one of the first ones uh, who uh, used, if not the first one, who actually used uh, uh, Jupyter for teaching. And if you go to jupyter.org slash about uh, or anywhere else, uh, you find uh, plenty of amazing people that are really inspirational. And you can follow them on Twitter. Now a lot of people are uh, um, moving into Mastodon, so we are a bit of in transition phase. 
and uh, mainly I recommend to watch their uh, videos on YouTube, on YouTube because they are really indeed uh, very um, inspirational. So all this uh, is uh, super cool, but then you can say, okay, where do, where do I start doing all this? Uh, well, um, if you already code, uh, my um, suggestion is always to start translating some existing code. For example, if you're at the beginning of a project and you have some little code in MATLAB, start by translating the code that you have in MATLAB into Python. <clears throat> excuse me, using Jupyter Notebook. Because uh, in that case, exactly like when we translate from, I don't know, English to any other language, um, we have to focus only on the syntax and not on the content, not on the algorithm, which adds a layer of difficulty. So this is a strong recommendation that I have. Then there are plenty of uh, online material. Um, for example, Geeks for Geeks and Medium are two among my favorites for um, to look in for examples and in general theory. They explain topics. Stack Overflow is fantastic for when one has the bugs or questions. Every time we have a bug or a problem or we are stuck, the cool thing is that uh, since these communities are so big, there is always somebody else who had the same problem before. So you just uh, Google it, you browse one or two pages of Stack Overflow and uh, you try out a couple of things and the problem is solved in no time. And then of course, uh, there are uh, plenty of YouTube videos if you prefer to learn uh, by listening. And then I have some contributions as well in case uh, um, you are interested as Francesco mentioned at the beginning I'm working on this book that is uh, basically the material I developed uh, while I was teaching Python. And uh, um, it's called the Learn Python with uh, Jupyter. Every chapter corresponds uh, to a Jupyter notebook. And uh, um, the flow of the book uh, uh, follows uh, the creation of computational thinking. So. It has uh, this ambition and it's mainly for beginners. Uh, it is open and now it is 40% uh, written and I keep uploading chapters as they are ready. And then what I've told you before about the Russian doll and so on is into this YouTube series called Introduction to Jupyter Notebook and Python. Then how do we use all this, given that uh, we like it, given that we are enthusiastic and given that we transition to it, how do we use the Jupyter Python environment to create open and reproducible code? So the first uh, recommendation that I have is uh, to create a Jupyter notebook that is readable. And this uh, sounds always uh, some, like something a bit uh, silly or trivial or boring, but I think it's the key because I really think that open uh, science uh, is not uh, just uh, throwing stuff uh, openly on the web. This just creates clutter. Things need to, to be clear, need to be documented, to be actually used and reused. Otherwise, just putting in there, we don't serve any purpose whatsoever. We just add noise to a situation. So what should we do? We should first make the notebook readable so that other people can actually read it. And it can be um, myself in two years or six months even. It can be my colleagues. It can be any other collaborator. How can we organize the narrative to make a notebook readable? Well, it's nice if at the top we write title, others, and the licenses. And then we continue with the aims or aim of the notebook and maybe a table of content if the book is too, if the notebook is too long. Then it's important to divide the notebook in paragraphs, each of them with the subtitles. And inside the, the paragraphs, it's important for each cell containing code, it is important to have a paragraph above that explains what's gonna happen in the cell below, why we are writing that code there. And after the cell, if there are results, it's important to write a comment about the results, what it is, uh, what it is about. And for me, this is fundamental because also, on GitHub, there are so many notebook, notebooks at this point, but many of them are just sequences of code. And for, for me, this completely loses 
the intrinsic uh, usefulness uh, of notebook of Jupyter notebook. Okay, one could just put everything in a .py file and and would be exactly the same. So narrative is fundamental. And then, of course, we want also to organize the code properly. So it's nice if at the beginning we put all the imports of the packages and then the functions and then the variables and the constants that we're, constants that we're going to use, and then the body of, uh, of our workflow, and finally the dependencies again. And I'm going to talk about them in the next slide. And so that is to make a notebook. Those are ideas to make a notebook readable. Now, what if we want to make it reproducible, especially if we are uh, attaching it to a publication? It is, uh, there are four things that uh, we should do. Uh, the first one is uh, to automatically download uh, the data from a repository. Let's say that uh, our data are on Zenodo. We can use uh, this uh, great tool, great Python package called wget. We write the file name, the name of the file that we want to download and uh, the Zenodo URL. Zenodo.org slash record slash these numbers here are the last digits in the Zenodo's DOI and then slash files. And then with wget.download and combining the strings, the notebook directly downloads the data and processes them. Then if we have to do some data analysis, uh, which can just be, you know, count how many women or men are in the study or the average uh, age of, of, uh, of the population and so on, we should not do it manually on Excel. Not because we hate Excel, we love Excel, but because um, in the moment where we start uh, shuffling and reshuffling cells or rows, we really risk to compromise uh, the original data and we don't want to compromise the original data and we want to know also how we got to that average from the original data so what do we usually do in excel we can do it programmatically in pandas which is really easy to use for this purpose third thing if we need either some randomness component in our notebook, we wanted to use a seed. So if you use NumPy, it's np.random.seed. And the, having always the same seed for the pseudo random generator allows us to always have a reproducible randomness. And last but not least, finally, the dependencies that are basically a printout of the versions of the libraries and of the characteristics of the machine. A package, actually a, a Jupyter extension that I like particularly is called the watermark that you can pip install uh, watermark. And then there are three commands load uh, with uh, uh, the um, percentage symbol in the front, load extension, watermark, watermark, and watermark minus minus i versions or iv. And so what this does is that it prints out the date, the, pi the version of versions of Python. IPython is basically Jupyter Notebook, the, what's behind Jupyter Notebook, and then the characteristics of, uh, of my machine, and then the version of the packages. And this is fundamental for reproducibility, but also for compatibility later in time. And again, if you wanted to uh, see all these in action uh, in an actual notebook and uh, how it works uh, you here there is a youtube video then what are the best practices in general for open and reproducible computational research as i mentioned i promise this is the last time it's important to write code and documentation for human beings so we want to write the narrative in the jupyter notebooks but we also want to write a proper code documentation how do we do it for the style we can use the style guide for python code here is the link that basically tells us for example all the conventions in the python community so for example um, variable names that are lowercase and if they are composed by different names, they are separated by underscore. And then uh, the NumPy style guide. So NumPy style guide is very cool, especially when it's about, for example, document, documented function. When we document a function, you see that we use uh, these uh, three, uh, three times double quotes, then we write uh, what the function does, and then parameters, with the underscore, the minuses underneath. And then there is always parameter or input or variable, call it the way you want name, 
um, the, the type of the variable and then what the variable is about, a description. And then in the returns, uh, we do the same structure and then we close. This is called the doc string. And there are some tools, as Sphinx, uh, uh, PyDoc, PDoc, I think it's pronounced like this, PDoc3 and Oxygen. And we can run this, for example, for this, I use the PDoc3. You can just run it and then we get uh, the documentation that goes in, uh, um, that can be collected in a website. And this is exactly if you look, for example, at uh, Pandas or whatever other uh, Python package um, that is part of NumFocus, they use uh, these kind of tools to create all the informations and examples and so on. Then, of course, we want to work uh, using version control tools, uh, uh, GitLab, uh, GitHub, uh, Bitbucket. I'm not going to talk about this because this is uh, a whole presentation by itself, uh, but we all uh, know how important these tool tools are. Then the other thing that is uh, super important uh, is uh, to release uh, a code, the code with a license. Every time we put uh, some code or anything actually on the web, um, it is automatically protected by copyright. So if we actually want people to use it, we need to add a license that allows them to use it. How do we choose a license? I, uh, here I recommend the three resources. The first one is chooseelicense.com slash licenses. It's a super cool website where you get all the licenses in the row and in the, in the column you have all their characteristics. So it's basically a big comparison of all the licenses, open source licenses. Then if you're more into reading a paper, um, this is a paper I recommend, a quick guide to software licensing, licensing sorry, for the scientist programmer. And then again, a video of mine where I also talk about uh, licenses for data. So all the creative common part, commons part. And then in publications, in publications, uh, we wanted to provide information about code and attach the notebooks. What does it mean? It is great if in a publication, in a table or in, a, in text as one prefers, about a software, both software that we both use and develop, it would be great if there is clearly stated where the, what is the repository, with the link, of course, where the documentation is, the language that we use, the license that we use, and the DOI and or citation. Because um, we want our code to be cited and we want to cite other people's code. But sometimes it's very hard to know how to do it. So it's important to state it clearly. And how can we attach notebooks to our publication? We can just say, okay, supplementary material, look for the notebooks here. It is a little bit more work for the reader. If we want to make it life easier for to the reader, we can do two things at least. One is, for example, in a table with results, we can create linkable um, results that when a, a subject, um, sorry, when a, a reader reads, um, clicks, on the table, the corresponding notebook opens right away. Or if we have figures, for example, in the figure caption, we can put the link, for example, to data, to the notebook, to binder, so that uh, the reader is able to play and reproduce our code and our graphs. And then uh, going back to the DOI, how do we get it? To get to the DOI to make our code citable, we can connect a GitHub repository with Zenodo. And again, the resources, if you want to see how to do it, click, click, click. There is either some documentation on GitHub or also I have a video. Of course, all this doesn't come uh, uh, from, uh, from me. Uh, all this uh, is a sum of uh, um, extensive uh, research in the literature and so on that I've made. And uh, there, is, there are some cool uh, papers out there that can really help us uh, at working um, in an open and reproducible way. Um, I strongly recommend the 10 Simple Rules series from uh, PLOS Computational Biology. Um, they are amazing papers written very in a very easy way and also with uh, very good content. Um, and they are, for example, about the writing and sharing computational analysis in Jupyter, uh, how, to do the reproduci how to do reproducible computational research, how to do with uh, uh, for GitHub, Git and GitHub, and then other, of course, publications, for example, good enough practices in scientific computing, the software licensing is the same as I mentioned before, 
and this about the, the paper of the future. So how can we actually document and share research from data to software to provenance? Is uh, open and reproducible research or coding an individual effort? No, it's a community game. We, of course, do our best, but the only way to grow is through a community. And uh, what can we do? Well, we can either join a community if it is already there in our field, or we can organize ourselves in communities. And this is what we did. Um, about three years ago, we started what now it's called the Open Reproducible Musculoskeletal Imaging Research Community or Ormir Community. We are about 30 people uh, now, 30 researchers coming from all over the world. And in fact, for meetings, time zones are always a bit challenges, challenging. And uh, we are really trying to, we're really working very hard to homogenize our code, to make it open, to make it reproducible, and to make it interoperable uh, across uh, our, um, our different expertises. With this, I would like to conclude the saying that, from my perspective, Open and reproducible computational research and research in general is not an ideology. Of course, that there are a lot of there is a lot of value. There are a lot of values behind all this. But for me, it's also and maybe even mainly a concrete way of working. It's the way I work every day. And so nowadays we have all the tools to do it. So we have no excuse not to do it. So let's just do it. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope this. Uh, was interesting for you and I'm open to any question.